Welcome to the NCO Journal Podcast. I'm Staff Sergeant Mark Moore. Today I'm joined by Command Sergeant Major Jeremiah Inman, the U.S. Army Africa Senior Listed Leader. The African Land Forces Summit creates the sharing of best practices between senior leaders used in steady state operations as well as both peacekeeping and anti-violence extremist organization operations. The annual week-long seminar brings together military leaders from across Africa for candid dialogue to discuss and develop cooperative solutions to regional and trans-regional challenges and threats. Could you briefly describe the history of the African Land Forces Summit and the intent of this conference? So there's been six uh, Land Force Summits uh, since 2010. Initially, we did it in D.C. to bring all the African land chiefs there. Um, we learned some lessons that it might be a better idea to do it within the countries of Africa. Uh, so we've held one in D.C., Uganda, Senegal, Tanzania, Malawi, in Nigeria, and then next year it will be in Botswana. Uh, the main purpose is... One, getting the, uh, the U.S. Army face out there in front of our African partners, building our relationships with each of the countries, but more importantly, getting the African countries talking to each other. You know, part of the African Union is, you know, Africans solving African problems, so we're just trying to help them, you know, facilitate that process. The importance of that dialogue and communication, a lot of that um, is going to stem on shared educational backgrounds and the uh, knowledge to, to bring forward the fight in, in a unified effort across Africa. Uh, what role does education play in increasing cooperation between our African partners and U.S. forces? So I think a big part of that, this, this year was the second year that uh, senior enlisted were invited to the ALS conference. So last year, eight attended. This year, we had 15, and that's out of 22 invites. And I think as we continue to develop and grow and place emphasis on education, that we'll get more, more enlisted input within uh, the Alpha Summits, for, uh, for example. The biggest thing about education, you know, and a point I tried to make at Alps was you don't want somebody operating on you who hasn't been educated in surgery. Um, the same, same process applies to professional soldiers. You don't want somebody going out leading troops who is not a leader of character who doesn't understand, you know, the basic duties and responsibilities of whether they're a logistician or an infantryman. So education, is, it's paramount to any, any development of any land forces. And, and as you stated, you made a good point. You don't want someone to operate on you uh, if they're not qualified to do so. So the ability for African nations to work together in a dynamic environment uh, directly affects security throughout Africa. Uh, in what ways... You know, can educational programs like this accelerate the process of unification? Well, I, I think education builds a shared understanding of whoever attends that, you know, development session. So you automatically understand the strengths and weaknesses of your peers. You know, a lot of these countries uh, in Africa, they'll kind of fight regionally. So, you know, it, it's not Somalia trying to solve Somalia's issues. It's the 11 countries around Somalia collectively trying to help them, you know, take care of Somalia issues. And education, you know, understanding your partners, understanding your threats, understanding your capabilities, um, that's the only way you're going to move forward. It, and recently we, we introduced the STEP process um, that might help accelerate this uh, shared understanding. Uh, the U.S. Army Select, Train, Educate, Promote or STEP model is a policy that represents the Army's investment in soldiers' professional military education through a deliberate, continuous, and progressive process. STEP has been introduced during the first African Land Forces Summit Senior Enlisted Leaders Program. Uh, why is this program a logical step in preparing African soldiers to attend higher levels of military education? So you're probably aware there are 54 countries in Africa. We cover down on 53 you know, all 53 of those countries, except for one, have been occupied by somebody outside of their country. So there's a lot of different influence within the continent right now. Um, those that have a Francophone base, you know, the highest level of enlisted they'll go is staff sergeant, basically a squad leader. And then you have Liberia, who is trying to exact model the U.S., you know, how we do NCOs and officers. Um, the STEP program was introduced last year. Um, you know, we've been trying to
trying to figure it out for 240 years. So we're still still trying to get it right. And STEP is a good tool for us that easily um, lays out the requirements, you know, from that, that soldier to become an NCO and continue to develop. As for the Africans, you know, we're not trying to force our ideas down their throat and say, hey, this is how you need to develop your NCO core. You know, my, my talking points to them the other day was, this is, this is a way that we do it, figure out what your country needs, and then we'll help, help build that requirement. You had mentioned that there are a, a few examples of how the STEP process has been introduced uh, into some of, the, some of the regions over there. Are, are there any additional examples that you might be able to provide uh, in how this training model has been adapted to meet the educational needs of African militaries? Yeah, again, not yet. You know, there's roughly uh, 140 institutions on the continent that teach some type of enlisted or warrant officer type development. Everyone has, every one of them has a little different flavor. Um, so specific step as it relates to the U.S. Army on the continent, no, I, I have not seen that yet. The uh, librarian sergeant major is going to attend the academy this year, the U.S. Army Academy, and I'm assuming after he gets back, we'll see uh, quite a bit of progress in Liberia. In, uh, in 2014, the Malawi Defense Force established a sergeant major's course modeled after the United States Army's sergeant major academy. Um, do, you, do you know who can attend this course, and how does this educational opportunity increase interoperability between U.S., African forces, and African-partnered nations? Yeah, so exactly how this course, you know, how it came to light was one of their NCOs attended our Sergeant Majors Academy, 2010, 2011-ish time frame, came back and said, hey, we need something like this. So they asked, you know, our Sergeant Majors Academy to come out and help establish that. So basically what happened is you're tracking the, um, where they got to the Sergeant Majors Academy, they go to school for a year and then they become a teacher for three years. So they take folks that go through that model and they assign them to certain countries. They come down, they help, uh, help out with POI development and instructor certification. And that's kind of how Malawi uh, Sergeant Majors Academy evolved. Do African soldiers from across the, the continent attend this one school or are there other uh, USASMA-like schools across Africa? So right now with Malawi, it's basically the southern portion of Africa has been invited. Um, I think there's eight or nine, you know, other country students in this class right now. And the very first class even had six um, non-Malawans attend the course. So they are reaching out and they are allowing their African partners to attend the course. And, and with the establishment of this based off of um, our Sergeant Majors Academy here in the United States, uh, there, there must be some parallels between the two. Uh, do you have any specific examples of what those might be? So, you know, leadership is a key one. Just, you know, being leaders of character. You know, we've, we've basically taken basic leaders course to the Sergeant Majors Academy, compressed it into a 16-week schedule that fits the needs of the Malawans and made it work. Um, so if you could compress the Sergeant Majors Academy into 16 weeks, I think it was pretty awesome. Absolutely. And then... Um, what, what lessons have the U.S. Army learned from this partnership, and have we applied any of these lessons uh, to our educational programs? So lesson learned, I think, would be we have 13 state partnerships within Africa. Um, for example, Botswana is partnered with North Carolina, and North Carolina has the ability to go down there and assist them, um, I'd say close to immediately, in development of their schools. So we're trying to use their state relationship to continue to get out their development in the other 13 countries that have partnerships with 11 of our states. That's probably the biggest, biggest lesson learned. Um, and again, that we use, um, you know, find out what the country needs, what they want, send some folks down there to do an assessment, link up with the Sergeant Majors Academy, get one of the MPEP Sergeant Majors to go down there and focus on POI development and uh, uh, instructor certification and then continue to assist until, you know, we and the host country are comfortable 
and they're self-reliant like Malawi is now. As you stated, we can't uh, say, you know, this is a U.S. solution to an African problem. This is how you should do this. Uh, I would imagine the same would apply to the countries in, in Africa uh, and their educational uh, needs. So are we looking for more of an understanding across the uh, countries in Africa of the educational system as opposed to a baseline education system across all of the countries? So I've, I've been here about nine months, you know, and I've been asking pretty much the same question with AFRICOM or higher and what they're looking at is encouraging a regional type NCO, you know, education system. You know, kind of like how we have GRTC on one end and NTC on the other end and heavy units go to one and light units go to the other one. Again, it goes back to do, do the countries want it? Can they support it and sustain it? And does it fit that region's needs and development as it pertains to NCOs? Because, again, I mean, you have you have one... One country, you know, Liberia, they have, you know, E1 to command sergeant majors. And then you go to Burkina Faso, and their senior NCO is a staff sergeant. Um, so it just kind of depends on how, how they've grown up and developed over the past hundreds of years. But regional is kind of what we're going to – we're trying to encourage because um, I think something that's something that's sustainable. Sure. And almost like an introduction to leadership or something like that, like a basic leaders type thing that's – uniformed across the board, and then from there, countries may adapt and, and grow their leaders how they see fit to meet their uh, specific challenges. Exactly, exactly. Because you're probably just seeing like the, the Marine Corps is just, they just redone what a squad is. So, I mean, all, all forces continue to develop to fit, fit the fight, you know, in society at the time. So, you know, a nine-man squad might not be the best for a Malawan defense force, but maybe a 12-man squad. I, I don't know. So it just helping them build what they can do to eliminate VOs within their country so they don't make it to America. Um, and, and looking out um, to the future, more in the short term, uh, you'll be attending the 2018 AUSA convention. Uh, what educational updates can we expect to hear about during the 2018 AUSA convention regarding senior enlisted development on the continent? I guess probably the only thing would be trying to encourage a regional type NCO education across the continent. You know, a lot of folks think they have to send, uh, you know, their land forces senior enlisted leader to the U.S. Army Sergeant Majors Academy, but that pretty much blows uh, the enlisted development budget for that country. Um, so if we can get something local, uh, maybe start small and, and make it a little bit bigger, that would be good. But we're talking probably five to ten years from now. Sergeant Major, thank you for joining us today. Is there is there anything else that you would like to add that's, that I may have left out or that's specifically important to the education system or, or what we may see at AUSA? I really don't think so, man. I, I just think that, you know, during our Revolutionary War, you know, you pretty much had officers and soldiers. And this is, this is my perception, my guess, my born-in-a-trailer education thinking this. But I think one of the reasons we probably established uh, NCOs, junior leaders, was because, you know, the U.S. militia would target British officers at the outset of battle. You know, they were marked by their brass plates on their chest. And without a leader in charge of that formation, you know, it was e easy to overwhelm, you know, cause confusion. Um, so I think that's probably part of the undocumented reason why we decided we need an NCO corps, you know, because that platoon leader goes down, that platoon sergeant's the platoon leader, you know. So I think our continued assistance with our African partners uh, so they can solve problems on Africa to prevent them getting to America and for the defense of our homeland, you know, I think it's, I think it's important that we play a part in this. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. My fellow NCOs, you can join in on the conversation by following us at facebook.com slash NCO Journal and on Twitter at NCO Journal. Put your knowledge to print, submit articles, and get published through the NCO Journal. Until next time, I'm Staff Sergeant Mark Moore.